Um, so the importance of data quality and governance in, in data-driven innovation with Greg and Stan. So uh, please introduce yourselves. Um, so yeah, there. my name is Greg Hansen. So I am CTO for Informatica across EMEA and Latin America. Uh, testing. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Goran. Um, hi, I'm uh, Stan, um, one of the co-founders of uh, Colibra, and currently responsible as a CTO for product management and a number of other things. Uh, first time in Stockholm. Thank you. <laughs> it's really nice out there. <laughs> okay, so so uh, perhaps a big question, but for starters, uh, we'll start with you, Stan, as you've travelled the furthest, I think. Um, your thoughts on data quality and data governance, what, what, why is it important? How is it important for accelerating data-driven data innovation? Um, I think it's about uh, the way you organize uh, around data. Uh, the, the example I always use are the companies that have been doing this uh, for, since they started, the digital natives, if you will. Uh, the way that they handle data, the way that they treat data as an asset uh, with governance, with quality, and so on. It's just built into their uh, nature, into their DNA. So the way that they're organized around this is, is significantly different from uh, all the other industries. Uh, and you just see the difference, right? The way that they get success out of data, the way that their analytics initiatives um, uh, succeed because they have that governance and quality built into their DNA. Uh, is significantly higher compared to the um, uh, other uh, companies. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, they are grabbing all the, um, the, the top line growth uh, at a much higher rate. Uh, so that's my view. The d data governance, data quality is built in and it gives them a lot more success. Thank you. Any comments on that? Uh, uh, sorry, we have, uh, we'll introduce you then in the middle of it. Richard, from yeah, Samarco. Sure. Um, sorry for that. I, I saw that you were running late, but um, I was waiting for the rooms to be divided into three, and clearly that's not going to happen. So uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. But yes, I'm Richard Branch uh, from, uh, from Semarchy. Uh, my background is mainly more in the uh, master data management side than the, than the data governance side of things. But um, obviously, um, you know, we would say that a strong MDM platform is fundamental to, to data governance. So uh, hopefully this will be an interesting panel and uh, look Indeed. forward to contributing. So, so uh, on that topic, data quality and data governance, are they connected and how are they connected and how do you align them? Um, absolutely, yeah. Uh, the, the, they are obviously, they're, they're connected. Um, I mean, the, the quality of the data is, <laughs> is dictated by the governance. If you don't have a powerful, a strong data governance um, process in place, then you're never going to enable the data quality. So, so my view is those two things are very, very clearly connected. Um, data quality is probably more related to the, to the software tools, or as Greg was saying earlier, the platform that you've got. Um, whereas I would say that the actual the governance of that data is more of a, a people thing, really. So it's down to um, how do you empower the, the people to apply that governance and then once you've done that, once you've got the right people empowering, um, empowering the governance on the data, then having uh, good tools, but there are lots of good tools out there to actually allow you to achieve that. And so I think it's that, that combination yeah. of, the, of the tools and the people. And we've spoken about data quality a bit today, garbage in and garbage out, and, and we're having bad decisions. And, um, but, but how do we measure success then for a data quality project? How do, how do you, apart from bad decisions, is there <laughs> a little bit more formal way? Yeah, so in the, in the in intro presentation that I gave earlier on, I talked about associating a value to data. Data quality is a really good um, discipline in which you can associate a value to a piece of data. Um, in fact, on our website, um, you can look at things like ROI calculators for, for data quality, and that's a good starting point because it'll help you to try and visualize the value of an accurate data quality record versus not. Um, I think it impacts everything you do or you will do in the future. You know, Stan mentioned about the digital natives and stuff. The, the, the organizations that really take uh, care of their data, that new customer contract thing I was talking about earlier on, um, and then can exploit it, are going to be the companies that succeed in the future. I think it's implicit in all of us to do that. And again, to, re to resonate something Stan said as well, it's about the DNA, putting it into the DNA of an organization. Uh, it has to be there. Uh, without it, 
you, you won't be, you simply won't be compliant with regulators. But more importantly, you're not going to be able to reach your customer base. But how do we put it into our DNA? What, what frameworks? What, what, what do we need? How do we do that? So uh, again, people, process, and technologies, I think, is, is a combination of all three. Um, and it has to start with a benchmark. You need to know where you are. So you know, when you start talking about data quality disciplines, the first thing you do, even before you're kind of mastering data or leveraging data, is you need to profile data. You need to understand where your data exists, that discovery exercise that I mentioned. But then you need to quantify what issues you have. Um, and even, I would say, as part of that profiling, you need to decide what a good record and a bad record looks like. And quite often, one of the challenges with organizations is, I talked about that fragmentation challenge that most companies have. I guarantee you that when you look at your customer data or product data across the many systems that you have, you will have different entities within a customer record across different systems. So in one system, you may, which may be a marketing system, you may have 20 attributes. In another system, which is shipping, you may have 25 attributes. So what really does a good customer record look like? Is it all of those attributes combined? Is it a subset? Is it a master set? You need to decide that. And then once, you, once you've got that, you need to start thinking about the people that you use to manage it, as well as the tools that Richard's already mentioned. But it starts with a benchmark of where you are once you've decided what good looks like. I think organizations that are enlightened, um, Stan mentioned about uh, roles, individuals. We've heard it before about data stewardship roles and so on. Um, the most enlightened companies in my mind, actually, when they understand the value of a record, they associate bonus schemes and so on to people involved in data stewardship, where part of their salary is influenced by the quality of the data that, they, that they've got ownership of. Mm -hmm. okay? and, w and once you've got those policies in place, it's about pushing it down throughout the organization. I can talk about that later as well. And, and selecting those, those most valuable assets, how, how do we do that? Wh which, what data is our most important data? Which ones do we start to govern? Uh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, it always applies to... Um, the specific context that your organization is in, I would say. Um, and what what we've seen a lot is that people start to uh, take uh, what they call a critical data elements approach or a, a key business elements approach or a uh, most important domains approach, uh, whereby uh, very methodically, right, they define uh, a number of criteria uh, as to what makes something key or critical, right? Mm -hmm. They say, well, it's important, it's key or critical if it's regulatory driven or if it adds to the top line growth and so on and so forth. For example, if it's in the context of a customer 360 initiative or a new digital product, those could be business initiatives and they could drive um, one of the criteria for importance. So you define your criteria as an organization and then you just uh, start to um, inventory all the data, right? You wanna find, understand and trust it. You inventory everything you got step by step, very methodically, as a process, right? Because remember, you're trying to uh, increase the data literacy, you're trying to create more data citizens. Uh, and then you just uh, measure that data element, the domain or the data set against those criteria. Right? So it becomes very methodical. And you say, okay, this data set is more important than that one. So let's focus the scarce resources we have. Let's, let's be honest. Any of these initiatives is always under-resourced. Uh, on the technical side, there's a lot of resources, right? There's a lot of money for buying technology to build more lakes and nodes, etc. <coughs> but on the human side, it's always under-resourced. But if we can show the value of it, it wouldn't be under-resourced, perhaps. Um, yes, but uh, here's the thing I've learned from uh, being on the road with uh, Benny, who was our VP of sales and marketing for, uh, for quite a while. He said, at one point in time, I don't believe in business cases, right? So... Yes, there are techniques to put a value amount on um, on data. By the way, none of them are standardized or agreed upon yet, but there are techniques to do that. But when you have to make a business case, when you have to put the importance of data into a number and then bring that number up to whatever uh, C-level executive, you've already lost in a way. Why? Because it's not about convincing that person with the numbers. It's about convincing or changing that person's belief Remember, they're working in an old world, in an old industry. They don't understand this, how to organize with data. So the business case is just a very weak argument. 
you have to really change the belief of that uh, leader because the business case is not going to uh, strengthen you against the the, the vet and fall example. Uh, sorry, it was yours. The, the fail and the fail fast, right? Mm -hmm. The business case will not necessarily strengthen you against big failures, right? It'll just shut down the project because the value did not come out of it yet. So you really have to get on that uh, belief of the C-level uh, executive, in my view. But I, yep. I was going to say, but I think there are situations where you can actually put a pretty tangible value on, on the data and the quality of that data. And Greg was talking earlier, and I think you know, all of us are all in agreement that there are some fundamental areas. And one is you know, regulatory that Stan just mentioned in compliance, where there are often there are some quite heavy fines and penalties. Um, and a number of our customers using our software for compliance purposes, um, they know the scale and the volume of the fines that they would be facing if they were not compliant. So I think in those situations, you can look at the fundamental um, pieces of data in a project and say, well, there is a tangible value to that. Um, just to give you one example, and actually Greg will be familiar with this, is the European Medical Agency with their identification of medical products, IDMP. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting synergy because one of our customers feeds into one of Greg's customers with this data, but there, there's something like about 250 um, pieces of data right. that the European Medical Agency require from the drugs and pharmaceuticals companies. And if they do not provide that, then there's a fine involved with that. So in that situation, you can say those are the, the 250 tangible pieces of data. They have to be of an absolute quality and they have to be accurate, otherwise the company will be fined. So in those situations, you can put a value on it. I think, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, there's value in the terms of um, uh, you know, avoidance of fines as well, which Richard mentioned. I think if you look into industries, if you go and speak to telco providers, for example, one of the, one of the metrics that generally drives that industry is things like ARPU, if you know what that is, average revenue per user. And the way that a lot of the telco companies work is they, they're monitored on things like churn, attrition of customers. Those are key metrics that drive their business. So it's, it, it, in those sorts of industries, uh, they're very customer-centric with high churn levels, for example. And that's the same for utilities that we talked about earlier on. And banking increasingly now with the ease to swap. You can and, and you should, uh, in my opinion, um, quantify the value of records. Where, where I do agree with Stan is which is, again, something I said at the end, which is when it comes to using the data, okay, you can, you can value the data in terms of the operational cost and the value to you within the business, but that doesn't give you the opportunity cost of not doing something with that data, right? And that's the R&D thing that I was talking about earlier on. It's having the right innovation cult culture where you invest and expect a high failure rate, okay? Because you don't know what the outcome's gonna be. How can you build a business case when you don't know what the outcome's gonna be? You base it on assumptions, you say this is more like an R&D. And the reason I said that is because businesses are used to kind of R&D budgets now. And the outcome of an R&D project is a high failure rate. But where something succeeds, it's got a high opportunity associated with it. Thank you. So we can certainly put our, our data in order in, the, in terms of importance or money or uh, what needs to be started first. So looking at it from the other side, what does it look like when we fail, when there's no data governance or data quality? <laughs> I've got an example, actually, that I was reading on a, on a website. We're all laughing, so we've got three good examples there, shall we? I, I think everyone <laughs> in this panel has been in and, and, and sort of been in meetings and thought, wow. <laughs> um, but I'll give you an example. There was one on the BBC website uh, last year, and it was a comp well-known company in the UK. It was Scottish Widows, who provides uh, insurance, investments, healthcare, and so on. And what they did is they sent out, they did a marketing campaign, and obviously they didn't do their marketing opt-outs and so on effectively. So they sent uh, thousands of letters out, and, and the regulator got 100 complaints back where they'd sent letters um, inviting people to take healthcare products out, you know, life insurance and so on, um, with false checks uh, sent to them. You know, you could have a million pounds if you, if you die or you've got bad. And these 100 people, they were, they'd unfortunately died, and it was their partners who were responding back to um, you know, the regulator saying, I just got sent this letter. It had a check associated that, that I thought was a, a policy that was associated to my deceased partner. And it's those sorts of things which <coughs> can destroy your brand overnight. Um, so uh, you, it's difficult to quantify what the cost is. Yes, you can associate it to value, but when you're thinking about the regulatory cost or the brand impact, of not doing it, that could be huge. That example that I quoted earlier on about retail, uh, target retail in the US, the 80 million 
um, customer, con uh, customer credit card records and so on that were leaked. Y you can look back at their stock price and what happened afterwards, it tanked. And they haven't recovered from that, and it's because their brand perception is now in the gutter uh, because of the lack of trust that they had, which is linking back to that customer contract I mentioned earlier on. So, you know, it's, it's huge if you get it wrong. Oh, no. Anybody else want to comment on? Uh, I agree, of course, although uh, even in one of the biggest examples that uh, recently happened with uh, f the, the controversy around uh, Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. Yes, their stock price went down significantly, but it also bumped back up <laughs> almost close to where it was. So in the end, I think the consumers don't always care uh, uh, necessarily. They forget quickly. We forget, right? Mm. Uh, all the things our banks, telcos have done with us, we're still with them. I'm still with the same bank from when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. um, it's just too difficult to change. I guess. Um, but I would say that I would argue a little bit controversially, perhaps, that nothing happens if it fails. And I've seen a lot of those failures, right? Uh, and you've all seen them as well. It, it just the initiatives turn into everybody's enthusiastic coming to the meetings because there's free pizza or whatever. <laughs> and then six months later, nobody's at the meetings anymore. And the spreadsheets go to waste. So I would argue that doing nothing, uh, that if you fail, Nothing will happen immediately because it's a bit like boiling a frog, right? It's only when the temperature reaches 100 degrees or 80 degrees that the frog starts to die. But before that happens, the frog is just nice and warm and cozy. And it's just thinking that nothing is changing. The change, the, the fundamental effect of not doing it successfully is that your business uh, goes away because it's overtaken by somebody else who is doing data properly, who is more intimate with their customer, who has the better digitized solutions. That, that would be my argument. No, I think you have a point. And there's <coughs> perhaps some comfort in that there is a little bit of leeway, a little bit of forgiveness, so it is, it is worth trying. Uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a generational thing as well. I mean, in, in the latter part of your example there, you talked about the fact that people will go to an organization who they trust, which implicitly suggests that they will switch. My, my approach to that is I think there's, genera there's a generational gap in terms of you'll see the reaction to that. I mean, people of my age group and above pr probably, you're right, they probably won't swap banks because it seems like it's too complex for us. But if you look at things like the Generation Z, which I don't know if you've ever defined generations, everyone talks about Generation X, but Generation X are kind of people who came into being um, you know, adults around the time of the millennium. Generation is Z, Z is a generation after that. And when you profile that generation uh, group, what you'll see is a, it's a very different um, uh, group of people in terms of the way that they act. Uh, it, I experience that when I'm interviewing now. I don't know if you guys, when you're taking people on, you take graduates on. A different philosophy around work-life balance. Um, they want to know about what your company is, what your company's beliefs are, and so on. That they are a different animal when it comes to their perception and their behavior in the marketplace. So if you think about, you know, is it going to impact people who are retired and 65 and 75? Probably not. They associate too high a risk with, with changing. Will it affect Generation Z? Absolutely. It'll turn on and off like that, in my opinion. So if you think about that in the context of your future businesses, Generation Z is not, you know, to your point around Facebook and so on, Generation Z is not the people that are using Facebook now. If you've got kids, they don't use Facebook. They use Instagram, Snapchat, and something else new every week. They're changing all the time. Uh, and that's the, that's the environment that we're in. So if we're not capturing the attention of that user group and servicing that user group, think about our future profits and revenues when they're the people who are earning a million dollars a year and you're an investment bank trying to attract their attention. That's the community that you've got to serve. And they will change. They will swap quickly. I was just going to go back to the point you were making about uh, examples of failure. Um, but it's not really an example of failure. But I think the key word to pick up there is not failure, but it's fast. Right. Because, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I genuinely mean that. I mean, it, it, I've probably got more years in the industry than either of these guys here. But <laughs> I can think of you know, many, many, when I'm visiting potential customers and they say, oh, we're using uh, you know, X, Y, Z piece of software, but we have a project that's been running for two years three years, um, and, ask, and then I'll ask the question, well, what does it achieve? Oh, it's not finished yet. 
and it staggers me the number of, yeah. um, you know, from my perspective, MDM projects where I go in and people are talking about some of the projects they've been running for two years and they've not achieved anything. So they don't even know if it's failed yet. But to me, I'd already call that a failure. So, <laughs> you know, I think that the fast aspect of this, do yeah. something, you know, within three months, four months, you should know yeah. if it's going to succeed and then if it's not succeeding, go back and revisit it and start so again. So go for it and fail Absolutely. fast. Absolutely, yeah. I believe yeah. there's a little bit of leeway yeah. and forgiveness from the market. You know, Greg's talking about the, the generation Z, yeah. you know, things are moving so quickly now, you cannot afford to have a project that lasts two years, or I think the worst I ever heard was um, three years. Um, I think uh, the, the, the industry is changing like that as well. I mean, as a, as a vendor, I think you see uh, the, you see our movement being moving more towards things like subscription-based economies as well, where people want to buy, turn you on, turn you off type thing, um, which put pressures on software companies like our software companies in terms of how we deal with you as, as customers. Um, what, what, that, what that drives is it drives a behavior where five years ago there used to be a governance project or an MGM project or a data quality project and, it, and it, it would be seen to be a $2 million project and it would be a two-year project. The, the instances of that happening these days are much, much lower and it's because people want to start quickly. They want to do almost like prototyping with sprint-based development philosophy and so on and so on and they want to get, value, get to the value point quickly and fail fast. And if they, if they do fail, then the subscription-based economy, they turn you off and the losses are minimized, okay? So it's the, if you think about how that our, drives our behavior, we've now got customer success managers and we've got uh, adoption um, people deliberately because that's the way that the economy has changed, where we have to service you from day one to make sure that, that adoption, you get to your value And that quickly. puts even more emphasis on data quality, obviously, to get yeah. it right from the start for the yeah. first time. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we can open up for uh, any other questions from you guys, if you'd like, before coffee. Do we have anybody? You shouldn't have mentioned the qu coffee before you said that. <laughs> Everyone's like, see you. <laughs> there's, there's coffee and sunshine out there, out there but they'd rather be here, no doubt. Um, if not, then we'll uh, we're finish. There's a question Thank over there. Oh, is there? Yeah. Thank you. Go on, over there. There's a microphone coming your way. Yeah, it's my morning routine, right? just going to go to the right place, that's all. Good morning. Uh, a question I have for you. Have any of you seen any companies that have been effective in putting a monetary value on data quality internally and then using that monetary value on data quality to really drive <coughs> improvements in behavior around data quality? Yep. I mean, I've, I've got an example of kind of uh, which are available on our website, publicly available, but LQOP here in the Nordics. Uh, a big uh, retail um, retailer here in the Nordics. So one of their problems, there were two things that they did. One of them was um, they actually identified the cost of, of onboarding new suppliers because it had to go through a human workflow process where it was taking sometimes weeks to onboard a new supplier, which then meant that they couldn't have new products in stores and they couldn't, if there was a trend, for example, they miss out on an opportunity value. And all those things were costed out to support uh, the investment of a, of a product. And one of the things that they managed to do is they then used that to quantify the budget that they wanted to associate to it. And then after the project, the, the success really was that they managed to reduce the supplier onboarding time by, by 60%, okay? Meaning that the cost was shrunk significantly. And then there was the opportunity um, cost, if you like, that they gained by having products in store quicker so they could sell that trendy product for six weeks earlier and get, and get the revenue rather than, you know, X other retailer selling it. Then there was a second impact from that success. They went and did the similar exercise for customer data as well. And they reduced their customer uh, data quality inaccuracies by 80%. The, uh, the most obvious thing that I see when you start to quantify things like that is marketing, in the marketing department specifically, is easy to quantify that. Because what you'll see is when you start to do your campaigning, you know, as my Scottish widow's example earlier on, which clearly wasn't that effective when you're sending it to dead people, but in, in LQOP's example, they were getting a much higher hit rate because the accuracy of the people that they were targeting was much, much higher than it had been previously. So you can, you can run a bench line and say, well, we run campaign X, we got response rate Y. We run the same campaign post our data quality initiative and you now get a response rate of Z. Compare the two, and you'll see that it has a significant impact. And then you can derive that down to that, that kind of value of data and use that on future 
future um, um, cases if you want to. Thank you. Do you have any other examples on that? Uh, yeah, Should definitely. Work. And uh, also, uh, as mentioned uh, on the website, some months ago, um, some of my colleagues in uh, Colibra commissioned a study with uh, IDC. Uh, and IDC went through a number of cases with our customers uh, and actually turned that into what value they had uh, achieved, what increase in value. So obviously you have things like cost savings and you know risk uh, mitigation or risk management. Those two, the boring parts, right? Those exist. But what they specifically looked for um, is uh, how much dollar or euro value did you add Right, and they went into those customers and looked what they had added, and they, the the results, the details are all in there. It's uh, on on the website colibra.com. Um, but one example specifically there is uh, how, uh, and it's it seems very silly, uh, but it's actually true, uh, how they actually found uh, additional opportunities, uh, and you know, I, I even. I'm Belgian, so we're typically a little bit scared by big numbers because we're a very small country. Uh, but um, uh, the uh, amount of additional opportunity they found was up to a hundred million dollars. So just hidden opportunities that uh, were now exposed uh, through the data, as one example. But uh, it's the, the details are all in the, the report. Thank you. Thank you. There's money to be made in your data to monetize your data, no doubt. <laughs> uh, if you get it right, that is. Um, any other questions? Go around right behind you. Um, well, uh, we have talked about the uh, governance of the data and uh, the data quality assurance. Uh, is there any strategy or tactics to, do, to deal with the, what we call the faulty data? Okay, what the company should do when we found this faulty data? Uh, should we just take care of them forever? Should we just, when to take the decision to throw this data or to fix this data? Or what should we do with it? Thank you. Indeed, what do you do with it? Yes, so uh, sorry, Richard, do well, you want to? No. no? Okay. Far away. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the obvious answer. And there's the microphone's web. The obvious answer is to apply as much effort as you can into fixing that data. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's the objective of all of our, you know, all of our software you products. Fix it at the base or fix it further down the line? Well, no, I, I would suggest you fix it on, you know, <laughs> at the base. Because if you don't fix it at the base, then there are instances where if you just fix it, as you say, down the line, then ultimately that, you know, the errors can be recurring. So it's important to fix it at the base. Um, but clearly, you know, all of our different types of software is designed to uh, enable it to be easier for you to fix the faulty data. Um, and yeah, you know, obviously I would advocate fixing it and fixing it once at the base. So I, I would say when, when it comes down to it, you remember the people process technology, I think that most, most people would ad adhere to, and we certainly subscribe to that as well. Um, the classic thing is where does the responsibility for data quality lie? Is it in business? Is it in IT? Well, I, again, I would say that it, it, it's a shared because we talk about it being the DNA of a company, so everyone should care, right? But ultimately, the people who can really identify poor data or accurate data is probably in the line of business, okay? And that means you need to engage them in the data quality process. So how do you set, I talked about that standard earlier on. You've got attributes of customer all over the place. We talked about that cloud fragmentation and so on. So you need to engage those people. So first of all, one of the things that's driven our investment in R&D in, in, in the way that we've worked is you start to generate screens, you start to generate technology that engages the business user, okay? Now, we were used to developing screens that engaged IT developers, for example, people who were used to coding technology and so on, but that, it's a different world now. When you want to engage in data stewardship, we're, we're engaging with everyone in this room, potentially. So we've got to design screens that those type of people can use. The people and the process bit is, you know, I talked about earlier on about motivating people, that DNA culture, maybe even if you can associate the value of, of data, that you can motivate people with bonuses and so on if you, if you benchmark your score and they make improvements. In the technology stack, you'll find that the technologies generally will root data quality problems to individuals, and then it's them to fix. Once you've got that standard, then I would say that first you do it centrally, which is usually in front of a lake or a data warehouse, and then you deploy that back to source systems, and you start to build data quality fire out walls around individual systems and put the, the context of system owners on those to make sure you've got ownership at a, a, a base level. Thank you. Thank you all three. 
and we'll call it a day there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.